Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this uh, session, uh, Strong Fiscal Foundations for Sustainable Development. I wanted to actually start off by thanking um, the, the people who were instrumental in organizing it. Uh, this is uh, Farah, Rabia, Hadia, Shandana, Emun, um, without whom this wouldn't actually be, be happening just now. Um, and I wanted to start off by actually introducing all of the, the people on the panel, and then we can, we can work our, our way uh, through. Um, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Mazar Wasim. He's Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Manchester. Um, uh, Ma Dr. Wasim is a research associate at the Institute of Fiscal Studies and a research affi affili affiliated Center of Economic Policy Research, London. He holds a um, doctorate in economics from the LSE, and his research is, as you will see, is primarily focused on public finance issues of emerging economies. Uh, the next speaker after that will be Dr. Etha Shah Mehmet. Uh, um, he's been affiliated uh, with the World Bank and the IMF. He's actually joining us from Washington, D.C., and um, more recently with LSE. He's written very widely on uh, public policy, fiscal reforms, multi-level governance, fiscal federalism, poverty reduction, and sustainable development. Um, he holds a doctorate in economics and public policy from the University of Sussex. Um, and then our third speaker, uh, who also really has been instrumental in putting this session together, and actually the conference together, uh, is Dr. Ali Chima, Associate Professor of Economics at LUMS. Uh, Dr. Chima is a senior research fellow at uh, uh, IDEAS. He is a co-founder of the Center for Economic Research uh, in Pakistan and a co-lead academic of the International Growth Center's Pakistan program. He's also faculty director of the Mehboobul Haq Research Center at LUMS and a member of the board of trustees of uh, uh, IDS, the Institute of uh, Development Studies at Sussex. Um, and then last but not least, in a way, the most important, because he is the one who actually implements uh, um, uh, the, the programs. We have actually have the pleasure of having um, the Minister of Finance of Punjab, uh, Mr. Mohammed Mohsin Khan Lagari, with us. Uh, truly a privilege, so that we can take what we are discussing, which is such important research, um, the underpinnings for sustainable development. Actually, the underpinnings for what uh, Mohsin Saab in the previous session talked about growth, and he says, what do you need for growth? You actually need improvements in human capital, and you need increases in physical capital. And ultimately, we are talking about the fiscal underpinnings of how do you do that um, in Pakistan, and then it's, it's, it's people like uh, the Minister Saab who actually implement uh, so we really are, are, are privileged uh, 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 to actually make a start with the session. And uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Wasim, please, if he could go first. Uh, I, hope, I hope we have him online. This is Dr. Etesham, but uh, we need Dr. Wasim to speak up, and then he'll probably come online. Yes, so thanks a lot, Kalsoom, for giving this generous introduction. And thanks a lot, organizers, for inviting me to this panel. So in this talk, I'm not going to present a paper. So instead, the focus of the talk is to like take stock of recent tax reforms in Pakistan to see why they have not delivered and why Pakistan still cannot collect the kind of taxes it wants to collect. And it's brief outline of the talk. So I will start by documenting some salient trends in collection of sales tax and personal income tax. So these taxes are important because if Pakistan has to develop its fiscal capacity, so then collections from these taxes, so they have to improve by a lot. So then I will give you like a helicopter view of, of, of recent tax reforms in Pakistan and the history of tax reforms in Pakistan is the history of failures. And in the final part of the talk, so we will talk, we will speculate about some reasons why, why, why these reforms have failed to deliver. 
So this picture defines the size of the tax challenge that Pakistan faces. So we collect around one third of the OECD average and our collections have not improved meaningfully in last many years. So what we hear in media that collections have increased by 10%, by 15%, by 20%, so that's just money illusion. And in, in real terms, so we are collecting essentially the same amount of revenue today, so we were doing like 20 years back. And the blips that you see here, so they are also the years when our imports went crazy and we had to like face the balance of payment crisis soon afterwards. So it's fair to say that we have, that there never has been a sustained increase in Pakistan's revenue in our lifetime. So to give you like some trends in recent tax collection, first about sales tax, which internationally known as VAT. So our sales tax is modeled along those lines, although not perfectly. So our collection from VAT are weak and they are stagnant. So we collect around three and 4% of GDP from this tax, but internationally countries collect up to even 15% of GDP from their tax. So consumption efficiency is a useful indicator widely used to assess the efficiency and performance of a VAT. And the idea here is that the tax is on consumption. If all consumption is taxed at the standard rate and there is no tax evasion and avoidance, so then the consumption efficiency of your VAT should be 100%. So the consumption VAT of our uh, consumption efficiency of our VAT is around 25%. It is less than one half of the world average. And even when you compare it to like low income countries, which are like the poorest countries in the world, so our VAT or our sales tax performs worse than other. So the consumption efficiency of 20% means that 75% of public and private consumption in the country is not taxed. It is not taxed either because there are a lot of exemptions and concessions or it is not taxed because there is a lot of tax evasion. So we still rely very heavily on imports for our VAT collections. So VAT is collected both on imports and domestic sales. Imports constitute only like 17% of our GDP. But if you look at VAT collection, still more than 50% of VAT comes from import. So this weak collection from domestic sources, this suggests very weak enforcement capacity at the level of FPR to enforce this tax. So on the other side, so our, our like, Revenue is stagnant and weak, but if you look at the other side, the compliance costs, so they are rising exponentially. So this is like one year of compliance costs. So this is minimum length of tax return. And it used to be like a one pager, one page return up to 2005. And since then it has grown by like 13 times. And along with it, so there has been like multiple new filing requirements. And as a result, so the compliance cost in the country have increased tremendously. And if you put these two things together, so which is stagnant revenues and increasing compliance costs, so we are making welfare even worse. We are making it harder for firms to do business without getting any positive side of increase in compliance. So I have said that the lower consumption efficiency of our VAT, so this could be because there are a lot of exemptions and concessions, or it could be because there is a lot of tax evasion. So in our, one of recent research, we look at like tax evasion directly of VAT in Pakistan, and this, these are the results. So on the horizontal axis, so we have like firm size. So these are smaller firms, so these are larger firms. So the tax evasion rate for small firms is like 80%. So they evade up to 80% of their true tax liability of VAT. So then this kind of goes down with size and at the top it's like close to zero. And if you look at the contribution of these firms in the total VAT which the country collects, so these bottom I think 90, 
90 percentile of the size distribution they contribute virtually nothing so there is all of all of tax is coming from the top few farms and at the bottom so there is a very widespread tax evasion so now to give you like few few trends on personal income tax collection of course we have a very narrow tax base only like less than 1.5 percent of the population they file their tax return and if you look at file tax returns so these red are the returns so where people report zero income and zero tax so 33 percent of filed returns so they're nil returns so they they, they 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 do not pay any tax which means effective tax base is even narrower than 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 the nominal one so then the median median income tax income tax paid by the median taxpayer is close to zero so a lot of these filed returns so they pay very very small amount of tax so in fact so there is around only half a percent of population who pay more than thousand rupees a month as income tax so very narrow tax base and whatever narrow we revenue we collect so this extremely concentrated at the top so top 0.1 percent of taxpayers so they nearly pay like 60 percent of the total personal and income tax revenue if you look at top one person so they contribute around 80 percent and if you look at like bottom 75 percent so they contribute virtually nothing so we have had some success in expanding our tax base in the sense that the number of filers so they have been increasing so if you compare 2018 to 27 2007 so there has been like three time expansion in our filing base so we have found new filers but these new filers so it mean it does not mean that the revenue from income tax is increasing because there's a much weaker far weaker growth of revenue relative to the like filing growth and again so in other papers so we look at like how much tax is evaded so what we found out is that at the bottom of the income distribution the tax evasion rate is as high as 70 percent so people misreport 70 percent of their true income and this happens even when the tax rate is 0.5 percent so the lowest tax rate that i have seen anywhere in the world even at this very low tax rate nominal tax rate of half a percent so people misreport their earnings by 70 percent so then to give you like a very brief overview of like history of recent tax reforms in pakistan and we have attempted many reforms so there has not been like lack of effort in this area so i have categorized these reforms into like three areas so we have tried to improve our tax administration so we have changed our tax policy at multiple times and then we have like introduced new innovative ways which 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 we should have like bettered our enforcement technology so what i am going to show you is like this this green line is the tax to gdp ratio of pakistan and through these vertical red lines i'm showing you that these reforms were enacted at these times and then we are trying to what we are trying to do is a very crude exercise and what we are trying to do is look at has this have these reforms like moved the needle in the sense that our tax to gdp ratio has increased like perceptibly so this was a very like large tax reform uh, tax reform tax reform administration reform program it is a tax administration reform world bank sponsored 150 million dollar and under this reform so we did a lot of things for example, we combined income tax and sales tax services to create an internal revenue service. We organized tax administration on functional lines. We created large taxpayer units, medium taxpayer units, RTO units. We upgraded the IT infrastructure of the department, which now is very impressive. And we, automa we have automated all business processes within the FPR. We doubled salaries of tax officials. So these are all the things so which 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 so so you can say that we have upgraded our tax administration to like what happens like in most rich economies and most developed world so this is the structure that that that's in place 
but do we find like any any fact so there is absolute so i can't see like any substantive effect of these these reforms so then i have like given you also some some sample of tax policy reforms to show that they have not like delivered for example we have increased our vat rate from 15% to 16% here did it make a difference probably not increased from 16 to 17% here so 2 percentage point increase nearly 14% increase in the tax rate did we like get the revenue increase commensurate terms probably not similarly we have like tinkered our exemption threshold here we increased it to like 10 million so this kind of negative reform this narrows the tax base of still, still no response so here we zero rated all five major export oriented sectors so this was again a negative ex negative reform in the sense that we tinkered with like the canonical the standard textbook design of vat we did not like get like much decrease in revenue as would have expected and then we like brought them back so again we did not get any push similarly in income tax so we have introduced many policy reforms so we increased the exemption threshold from 100k to 300k so this is also unheard of that in one go so you just triple the exemption threshold in the country so as a result of that so we virtually eliminated income tax in the country because it was it it became like a super tax but it, it had no effect so we decreased the in corporate income tax rate from 34 35 to 34 34 to 33 to 32 31 30 29 six percentage point decrease in corporate income tax has no effect so then i've collapsed club together many enforcement technology reforms and so I, what I've tried to do is also put some references in front of them just to show that these are very recent cutting edge tax reforms if you go to like a public finance expert and ask them so what should we do to do, like improve our tax collection so they will suggest one of these things to improve tax compliance and the bad news is that we have like already implemented most of these reforms and they have not delivered anything so there seems to be like completely ineffective so then the puzzle so then the puzzle we are facing is so why why has there been like no effect whatsoever of everything that we tried and we tried many things so in a recent paper what we find what we found is you have already seen like this 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 picture so fbr so they do have the capacity to detect tax evasion so this tax evasion is from uh, this this tax evasion rate so that i show you so this is from the audits that the fbr conduct so their audit is effective in the sense that they do detect tax evasion but when at point t you 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 detect a tax evasion of a taxpayer then then it must have some deterrence effect in the sense that the behavior of that taxpayer must change in the sense that they know that they would be caught but do we observe like any deterrence so there is absolutely no effect of fbr finding out that somebody is evading tax on their future behavior so the puzzle is so we are able to detect but we are not able to deter this is kind of strain and to make sense of that so so you look at like economic theory so what guidance economic theory provides so there are two types of models so that you can rely on so you can think of like tax evasion as a rational choice so under this model so tax evasion is like a gamble the taxpayer plays so there are some costs of this gamble in the sense that if you are caught if your tax evasion is caught you would be asked to pay penalty along with the unpaid tax and and there is some benefit as well and the taxpayers so they trade off these benefits and costs to decide whether to pay or not to pay so then and there are different types of models so where the evasion is seen as influenced by these social and psychological factors by this intrinsic motivation to pay a tax because we are like through natural selection has primed us to be like incredibly pro group animals so we we care about how our peers view ourselves and there are so many other motivations 
So, but when we look at both these channels, so they fail in our case. They fail in our case. So, rational deterrence fails. So, the rational model fails because there is extremely low cost of evasion in the country. So, evasion rate, as I told you, is 70% even the, when the tax rate is half a percent. So, it means the tax evasion rate, sorry, the tax evasion cost is even less than half a percent. So then they have been like frequent tax amnesties. So one almost every second year, three in last four years. So these amnesties, so they have been very frequent and they have been very generous. So imagine living in a country where like inflation is 10%, but we are allowing people to like, we are allowing people a waiver of their past liabilities on payment of 2% or 5% of their liability. And this has been happening like every two years. So this sends a like very, so it's akin to like government sending a very powerful signal every second year, the tax compliance is not important. So you can evade tax and you can like bank on us to bail you from this with, with, with a very generous deal. So then in addition to that, so there's like very lengthy litigation. So this number is from what FBI reported to Public Accounts Committee of the Parliament that 1.9 trillion is spending. So this litigation is like a perpetual amnesty scheme so that our courts are running. So, so which means so the courts, so these cases are not decided. So even when they are decided, so if you look at data, so the penalties and additional tax are waived off. So then it's like, if you put all these things together, so there's high inflation, lengthy litigation. So there are frequent and very generous amnesties. So then it becomes rational not to pay tax and definitely not to pay tax in time. Because if you delay, so you can deflate your tax liability. If you if you are able to delay 10 years, so with 10% inflation, so you would be paying like a very meager amount at the end of it. And again, so as I said, even if there is no amnesty in the meanwhile, so there would be like one granted to you so the waiver of penalties and taxes would additional taxes would be given to you by the courts anyway so 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 there is not an issue so then we should not be surprised that people are not paying because the incentives the way the incentives are set up so it's optimal not to pay tax and it's optimal definitely optimal not to pay tax in time i know you're coming to an e to closure but i just wanted to speed you up because we have only an hour remaining and still two more presentations okay so so i cannot like hear could not hear you clearly but i am winding up my presentation in Thank one you. minute so pakistan as i told you is like a low tax country so we at at 10 percent of gdp our tax burden is not large it is one of the lowest in the world but the dis the tax burden is distributed very unevenly so it is distributed unevenly because some incomes, so they're harder to evade than others, so they're harder to hide than others. So as a result, employees on average, so they pay 70% higher effective tax rate than someone who drives their income from business. And there is almost virtually no tax on agriculture and capital gains. And because, so this, this introduces unfairness into the tax system and this saps citizens intrinsic motivation to pay tax so there is no horizontal or vertical equity so then there is very strong sense that taxes are expropriated by elites or even if they are not ex expropriated so they 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 are perceived to finance elite consumption and as a result the social compact is broken so then i will leave you with like the final point so the establishing credit uh, deterrence which means deterring tax evasion requires credible commitment to enforce tax and that has been lacking and consistent with what Basley and Persson say so our elites they did not have like strong incentives to build our fiscal capacity and as a result the citizens so they have not evolved like strong norms of tax compliance and we are stuck in the, like this vicious cycle so I stop here and then look forward to like hearing what Ita Sham and Ali has to say and to your questions. Thanks Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vaseem. Certainly a very thought provoking presentation to get us started. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move right across to Dr. Ahmed, who's kindly joining us from Washington DC where it's 
3.30 in the morning. So um, over to Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Kulsum. Uh, Salam alaikum, everybody. Uh, today, uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you. This is now 40 years since I started working on tax reform in Pakistan. We extended work on India with Lord Stern to Pakistan and Mexico in 1982. And by 1985, we were ready to make our recommendations, which we did to the Kamrul Islam Tax Reform Committee. Um, I shall start sharing my screen. My presentation uh, is very much along the lines of uh, what we hear from Dr. Wasim, although I will speak a little bit more about governance issues and uh, why Pakistan has failed where India uh, actually has done better, starting out from similar conditions and countries like China, which I started working on as an academic at the LSE in 1986, and then as an IMF staff member helping the 1993-94 reforms, uh, and then continuing after I left the IMF, both with Mexico and, uh, and China. So why are these differences? And the recommendations we had made to the Kamrul Islam Committee we presented to the finance minister and agriculture minister and other ministers in the planning commission auditorium in 1986. Then finance minister, what to, this is 20th of March, 1986, said domestic revenue mobilization is critical. He actually slept through the proceedings. And this was just a summary. Um, the Kamrul Islam committee report uh, was shoved. And the question is, why was that case? Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about, um, the, as I said, governance issues. Uh, let me move now to the full presentation. Um, there we go. Excuse me. So the question is, why are we lurching from crisis to crisis and continuing a reliance on foreign borrowing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Constitution and the heritage from the Government of India Act, and then from independence, what had to be done in Pakistan at independence, at the shop, and sorry. the effect it had on you. revenue sharing we and the incentives to keep the country together. Yeah, yeah. We don't and see your slides. much along the, the lines show. of uh, Dr. Wasim, oh. it's a question of uh, sure rents and elite capture, also rents for the, geographic rents for the country itself. And the problem has been that quite a lot of the policies that have been implemented on the constitution and the allocation of responsibilities follow a normative US-based model, which is not appropriate. And, you know, Pakistan is one of the IMF's worst repeat offenders. And why is that? And of course, also, you know, not all the blame should be given to the, the country. Some of the advice that has been given to uh, uh, Pakistan by the, the international agencies essentially is a form of market fundamentalism and doesn't really account for the political economy uh, considerations of Pakistan. And really what one wants to think about is accountable governance and greater resilience. Um, the question is why is the same question that Dr. Wasim has posed, but with a slightly different focus. When we talked to the Kamrul Islam Commission, the tax GDP ratio was over 14%. It's now for 10% despite the, the VAT. And I think Dr. Wasim very nicely shows you some of the problems. One of the key issues in my view, is that the VAT has been split uh, and has added to the cost of doing business. And as Dr. Wasim correctly pointed out, you have the lowest C efficiency in the world. But it's also linked to decline in basic public uh, services, yeah. increasing inequality, both interpersonal and across regions. And the At problem the is that the overall fiscal constraints and vested interests pose a major problem 
in responding to the global economic and climate shocks. Okay. And the emphasis on decentralizing full functional responsibility to the lowest possible uh, level of government, everything is problematic without accountability. And here the issue really is, how do you get accountability at the subnational level? And you need to have subnational revenue heads. And the revenue sharing doesn't do it. And there's emphasis now on public-private partnerships and private operations with CPEC, the Special Economic Zones. And these may actually accentuate the revenue problems and incentives to cheat. So really, uh, with the global financial markets in, ter in turmoil, uh, post-COVID and increasing interest rates, uh, the country teetering on a debt spiral, really one needs to go look at the fundamentals. And let me just talk a little bit about the genesis of our governance deterioration. So the Government of India Act of 1935 was a colonial administration what, with elected provincial and state governments. And the the constitutions of India and Pakistan very much reflect the Government of India Act 1935, which is one of a colonial administration, where the Crown kept the main revenue earners, customs, excises, split income tax on agriculture and non-agriculture, and elected uh, provincial officials uh, found it very difficult to tax land and agriculture, uh, and had a final point sales tax. So it shifted the onus of the visible taxes to the elected governments. And of course, what actually happened was that the land tax collapsed in 1935. And it, this had been the mainstay of public finances from Mughal times until then, generating about 8 or 9% of GDP. And it fell to absolutely nothing following the Government of India Act 1935. And then, of course, the split revenue bases, tax by tax administration, including at subnational level, poses a huge constraint to establishing a modern tax system that relies on information sharing and management. And the incentive structures, which I think Dr. Nassim, I very much agree with him, uh, also come into play. So really these issues of information management and sharing have not been adequately addressed in any of the South Asian countries. It's caused major uh, cause for creating rents and incentives to cheat. At the Sham. Post 1947. Sorry, sorry, can I the, interrupt you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Your slides Barely. are stuck. Your slides are stuck, and uh, we we you have to adjust it yourself, please, from your computer. We don't. Oh. So we, can we just go back? Give him the screen. Yeah. Okay. It, it never can moved you to now? your slides. Thank you. Can you see it now? One second. Can we go back to? The his screen. Can you see it? Zoom. Yes, now we can. Thank you. Okay. So, um, post-1947, Pakistan didn't have tax instruments. And it was forced to centralize the sales tax with major political consequences, especially with East Pakistan. And the revenue-sharing award was patently unfair as far as East Pakistan was concerned and was a major cause for the uh, unhappiness of the Eastern Wing that eventually led to its separation. There's a huge uh, focus on the West, heavy focus on tariffs and quantitative production uh, for infant industries, mainly in the West and Karachi, and that continues. And it's very consistent with the story that Dr. Wasim has told us about. But if you look at the 1973 constitution, it guarantees compulsory and free education till secondary level. That's Article 37B. But within the minimum possible period, it's been 50 years since the 1973 constitution. It also guarantees uh, access to higher and technical education on merit. It's not subject to the minimum possible uh, uh, period. It gives very Bismarckian benefits for all citizens, basic necessities of food, housing, clothing, and so on. It's very clear, no targeting or scorecards that are, that are subject to capture. 
These are constitutional basic rights and should be actionable in court. And any moves subsequently on the policy side must respect these guarantees. But this has not been the case. What we see is uh, increasing aid dependency, initially leveraging uh, position against the G uh, USSR, 50s and 60s, and then post 9-11, really bulwark uh, against Soviet invasion. And the reason the Kamrul Islam Committee report was shelved, of course, was a bonanza that came after Afghanistan and the war with the Soviets. So I gave a seminar in FBR in October 2019. Not one person had seen the Kamrul Islam report. There were 200 people in the auditorium and they couldn't find it in the library. So, of course, also the reason is that there's been a stop go in US aid and the stop go has been filled by the IMF and the World Bank. So as far as the government and people of Pakistan are concerned, they don't see much difference between the US support, the IMF support, but that has changed. And I think they need to realize that. So the removal of GST exemptions, just to give you an example, was a structural benchmark in, this, in the standby and ESAF arrangement in 1993 with the, with the Benazir Bhutto government and was reported to the IMF that all the exemptions had been removed. 94 exemptions removed. And the 2008 program, which I managed to negotiate with Mohsin and others uh, representing Pakistan was based on the premise that you're going to fix the holes in the VAT. The core, core commitment. But it was very clear to me that they were not going to do it. And it was a cause of the failure of the program. And Mission Chief Adnan Mazari said, no VAT, no money, and stop the program. But since then, they've dropped the VAT in, in the program conditionality. Really, uh, adjustment now, you're adjusting, you're in an IMF program, you're not going to do the VAT. What do you have to do? You cut transfers to the provinces. You have to do that to meet the uh, financing uh, requirements. You cut pro transfers to the provinces, which Punjab and NWFP objected to, you're cutting basic public services. You're jeopardizing the NFC, you're jeopardizing constitutional guarantees, you're jeopardizing meetings, the SDGs. So this is the history of Pakistan. This is a paper I did with my former late colleague, Aziz Ali Muhammad, and it's published in the Handbook of Contemporary Pakistan. It shows you how uh, aid to USA to Pakistan has fluctuated to the period 2010, and how the IMF and World Bank have stepped in. Uh, the Kamrul Islam committee report had no effect. Uh, Shahid Hussain committee report uh, had absolutely no effect. So really, it's the U.S. Uh, uh, and IMF World Bank are seen as uh, you know pretty much the same uh, same kettle of fish. So why is it so difficult to implement a VAT? And it's the question that I've asked not just in Pakistan and a number of other countries, including Mexico, which I'll talk about a little bit more. It generates gainers and losers amongst provinces and states and requires offsetting taxes and intergovernmental transfers. This is a big lesson from the reforms that I helped introduce in China in 1993-94, uh, and then again in 2018 when I helped them uh, with the completion of the VAT reform. So the integration of uh, the goods and services base in 2018 helped China to remove the borders around the special economic zones. And the creation of the high-tech zones is fundamentally due to the fact that they were able to remove these borders. So Pakistan has treated the VAT as a standalone measure. So all the reforms to the VAT are concentrated on the VAT, and they don't work. Because you've got gains, gainers and losers, and we've got gainers and losers, you end up with a whole bunch of slews of SROs and exemptions, and the mother of all SROs was SRO 283 uh, in April, the 1st of April 2011, at which point I stopped advising Hafiz Sheikh, which is basically making friends and punishing your enemies and completely destroyed any incentive to pay the tax. 
any tax for that matter. India, uh, on the other hand, uh, I've also been involved with the same length of time, is moving the right direction, has carried out a constitutional amendment, but it's got an incomplete base, multiple administrations, so it's not as efficient or as uh, as attractive a base as it could be. Still very complex, end of compensation transfers. So 18th Amendment, you could say had good intentions, but very bad outcomes. So you split the base of the VAT between goods and services, etched it into the Constitution. Didn't raise additional revenues, as Dr. Basim has clearly shown. Uh, added to the complexity, added to the cost of doing business. Again, very nicely shown by Dr. Basim, following 2010, huge increase in the burden of compliance on taxpayers. Did not generate information needed for implementing the income taxes. Who is cheating? So it, what you really have is an inefficient overall revenue base to cover basic spending. And the IMF, before the pandemic, estimated that Pakistan needs another 16.5% of GDP for the SDGs. 16.5%, you're collecting 10. So what do you do with the political economy of taxes? and ta One of the biggest problems, as I said, is relying only on one tax in isolation at a time because they're gainers and losers. You can't offset gainers and losers by only focusing on one tax. So really what you have to be doing is to assign weights to human, social, natural capital inequality in all your tax decisions and look at taxes as a whole. And differentiation in the overall tax element in the price of goods uh, comes about by looking at multiple taxes, not by creating holes in the VAT. You need a VAT, you need supplementary exercises, and you need spendings to be also uh, made consistent with your social parameters that you, the government, whichever government is in power. So you really what you need, a combination of taxes, public sector pricing, and spending. And a simple VAT with full coverage and minimal exemptions helps to create a unified economic space and generate information that you can use for the income taxes. You can't go for the personal income tax, expect to make money by taxing your chaprasis and peons. You really have to have information on uh, what the large taxpayers do. You can supplement it by uh, uh, excises, including on carbon. And then revenue sharing and uh, equalization transfers uh, come in. So a little bit about China. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. In 1993, sorry, sorry at, at the champ, five minutes, uh, please, uh, to wrap up, five to seven yeah, well, minutes. China yeah. had taxes and transfers combined in creating a new tax administration. They shared the VAT with goods, with, uh, on, 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 on local, uh, uh, local governments. No individual compensation, by the way, when they brought in the VAT. This was the success of the Chinese uh, VAT reforms. The problem in China is that it the concentrated activities along the coast, and that's led to problems of congestion and pollution. So in China, now you have a huge problem of subnational accountability, and you need subnational own source revenues. Again, you can look at these uh, uh, slides. I don't have time to go through them. So what you have in China is now an absolutely urgent need for a local particularly a property tax, and that experimentation with the US-type property tax in Shanghai and Chongqing has failed. Um, so in the, on the other hand, Mexico looked very much like Pakistan, non-competitive trading regime full of holes following uh, uh, NAFTA. Finance ministers since the 1990s tried to fix the VAT, couldn't do it. They tried to fix the income tax and they couldn't do it. They were doing it on a tax by tax basis. And the tax GDP ratio uh, stagnated around 10%, VAT efficiency 25%. The Pakistan story, as Dr. Basim has uh, very nicely shown. Social sector financing, good intentions, bad outcomes. They had formal sector uh, benefits paid for by uh, payroll taxes and huge generation of informality. And Levy's recommendation was to move from payroll taxes that add to the cost of doing business to financing by the VAT, except the VAT didn't work. 
So what did they do? You had split bases, uh, income taxes uh, and VAT. It made worse by the special economic zones. So really what you had is the traditional story of large taxpayers paying taxes and small taxpayers being in, in, invisible. But what we saw was that uh, really the reason why the large taxpayers were able to evade taxes is they were transacting with other taxpayers that are outside the tax net. So you could hide your value added, you could hide your income taxes, your payroll taxes, everything. So your tax GDP is 10%. This is what you see in Pakistan as well, as Dr. Wasim has very nicely shown. And the special economic zones, of course, also create uh, an incentive to cheat, carousel fraud, import fraud, export fraud. So really, you have ready-made fraud in the constitution. So what did they did in uh, 2013 was to go against the textbook model. They effectively dropped the threshold to zero and gave point of sales uh, packages to small taxpayers outside the net, so forcing them to issue electronic invoices. That stopped the cheating from the large taxpayers. The revenues went up from the large taxpayers. Tax GDP ratio went up to 15% in three years. There was no compensation as part of the uh, uh, of this program. Had a BISP type uh, special uh, purpose transfer, which was abolished. The conditional cash transfer in Mexico was abolished in 2019, and Pakistan needs to know that. Uh, so the reforms to the VAT created a level playing field subject to connectivity. And this is what happened. It turned the whole country into a special economic zone because you could export from wherever you were able to source. It didn't matter. You got the money back as soon as you export. It didn't work in the South because there was no connectivity. So really, they have a problem with, with growth. So really, coming to own source revenues at the subnational level, own source revenues at the subnational level means the ability to set your rate at the, at the margin not shared revenue. Shared revenues do not provide basis that you can use for accessing finance. So perhaps, you know, the issue could be consolidate your income tax, create a national tax agency, make FBR uh, like the SBP to serve all uh, levels of government, and then have a simple property tax to quickly raise one and one and a half percent of GDP. And that can be done. And the proposal is to go for a beneficial property tax the seminar I gave in, in uh, at LUMS in this uh, auditorium in January 2020, I'm going to talk about briefly now, it's a recent book that's just been published. So you want to align local taxation to incentives for sustainable outcomes. So you want local on source revenues to finance basic services. So you're not subject to the cuts from the IMF or, or variations in national taxes. And you want access to credit for infrastructure. And that has to be uh, a key element. And then, of course, using blockchain and new information technology allows you to simplify both the tax administration and the and the and the treasury uh, circuits. Estimates we did for v for Mexico to generate one and a half percent of GDP uh, shows that just bringing in the tax alone on an occupancy basis linked to uh, size and location. I know we have some elements of that in Pakistan, but it's not linked to basic services. This is critical, and it shows you that it'll be higher in Mexico City uh, relative to uh, poorer states, and that it actually improves inequality depending on your equality of version parameters. But you have to then change your revenue sharing arrangements and equalization framework at the same time, so you're not eventually giving up, giving more money to the rich uh, rich regions. So yeah. you want to make it possible for every local government to provide similar levels of service at similar levels of own source revenues. And that's a very fundamental element, which means that you have to rethink your the way that the Finance Commission does its work. Um, of course, you need you financing. To, sorry, could I oh. ask you to summarize, please, in the, the next minute yeah, or I'm so? Going to because do that, we... But I think yes, really, you. if you're looking at financing for shocks, climate change, and natural disasters, you have to have a uniform basis for basic service pro 
provision, and that has to involve the externalities of uh, provision at the local level. As you've seen in the response to COVID, it required the national government, the provincial governments, and local governments acting together. That's not what is implied in the 18th Amendment. So you really need to look at what the spending assignments are and look at the balance between the spending assignments, own source revenues, uh, so that you then uh, have the basis for uh, sustainable growth. So really you have to get back to also looking at how to prevent leakages, not just in, in revenues, but also in your spending side and the functional responsibilities. And, and you need the two together. You're not going to get the right incentives without the correspondence between the spending and the revenue side. So the complex functional economic categories is problematic. And really, I don't have time to go into this, but really, if you're looking at uh, assigning a function, you have to also go into the components of a function and the ability to monitor what is being done uh, to actually access uh, you know, the loss and damage fund. There's no money in the loss and damage fund to begin with. Let's assume it, you had the money. How are you going to use it? How do you make sure it's not going to be stolen? It's the same story as on the tax side. So really the elements is to look at the assignments and financing, rethink the governance arrangements. Tax reforms are not just about revenues, about easing the cost of doing business, creating a unified economic space and for guiding investment decisions. And own source revenues are central for access to credit for, for private investment. And then the political economy aspects of China and Mexico, there are lessons there. You can't replicate what they do, but you can think about what they did, what's different from what they did to the standard recommendations from the IFIs. And the options for Pakistan in the short run are that you have to be within the constraints of the 18th Amendment and will have to rely on agreements between the provinces and the federation. That's a big task. And I'm sure Ali Chima will be able to tell you how to do it. Thank you very much. Sorry for Thank taking you. so long. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. And now uh, over to uh, uh, Dr. Chima. Okay, uh, I'm going to kind of drill down from where um, Ithisham started, uh, Mazhar started and then Ithisham took us. So Mazhar started in terms of the federal challenges. And I'm going to be focusing on subnational challenges, in particular property taxation. Uh, I think one thing that comes across from both Mazhar and Itisham's presentations is that property taxes are a very under-tapped source of revenue, but they're a very critical source of revenue. But before I kind of jump into my presentation, I want to really acknowledge that this work has been done very collaboratively with the Excise and Taxation Department in Punjab, and I, I see the ADLG Saab uh, and Faisal Saab here. Um, so, you know, this is based on data that we've been collecting and working with with the Excise Department uh, for the past four years. Uh, and it's on the agenda of the provincial government, but the needle is not moving. So, so I think there are real stakes here. So, like Etisham, um, I'd like to basically start by saying that we, we shouldn't think of the tax problem as simply a problem of stabilization. And I think that there's a big problem in Pakistan that we think of the tax problem as a stabilization problem. Um, and that's how the press report sits, that's how the politicians react to it. But actually, when you look at property taxes, and in the Pakistani context, property taxes are urban property taxes, the big challenge that you're talking about are massive service delivery deficits. So these are just headline items for, from different reports about urban service delivery deficits. I'll, you can read them. I'll read out a couple. For example, if you look at urban Punjab, four in 10 households don't have toilets connected to sewers. Or there is an estimated 6.4 million uh, deficit of housing units. Right? Th these are big deficits. Um, and the question is, how do you finance these deficits? Um, and this financing challenge is rising in the context of really high rates of urban population growth. Um, so urbanization is really rapid. The graph is basically showing you rates of population growth, which is a calculation between the last two censuses. 
the red bar is rural Pakistan, the brown bars are urban Pakistan. So effectively, Punjab is <coughs> rapidly urbanizing, uh, and we have to think about this challenge in, in this context. Um, and typically, when we think about urban financing, as Atisham very correctly pointed out, property taxes are seen as the bedrock uh, of that financing. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to throw some numbers about how we're performing, and then my big thing, which kind of builds on what Etisham was saying, and what Mazar was saying, that really what's broken is the tax policy framework. Um, and I'm going to give you different dimensions of why that is broken. So let's start by a simple uh, measure, which is property tax utilization. Um, the left-hand side is, compares Punjab with lower middle income countries. So the lower middle income country average is about 0.34% of GDP. Punjab is at 0.05%. So these are huge gaps. You do something different, you look at sort of some of the uh, Indian cities like Bangalore, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Chennai, you look at their per capita collection of property taxes, compare it to Punjab. There are huge gaps. When I discussed this with Etisham, he told me these aren't stellar examples of property tax successes in the world. So we're not comparing uh, Punjab to successful examples. Then you look at basically tax equity. So what these graphs are doing is they're taking different categories of zones because property tax is a zone system. So we have different zones where different values and rates apply. And it's plotting the average tax rates against property values in each of those zones. And what you can see is that each of these graphs basically shows a regressive schedule, right? So you're correcting, collecting massively low amounts of taxation in a regressive manner, which is, by the way, very similar to the story that you heard from Mazar about federal taxes. So it's, it's not incredibly, incredibly different. Except here the story is slightly more complicated. We see this for residential property. In commercial property, the kind of regressivity disappears in all categories except for the richest categories. So this is commercial properties, which is again regressive. Um, so then the uh, question is, why is this happening? And you know, the bulk of thinking that's gone around in terms of reform in property taxes, unlike federal taxes, has been around administrative reforms. So what we've been discussing with the Punjab government uh, for the past five or six years, and it's across different types of government, is basically where are the breakages happening in the policy chain? Um, so just kind of before I jump into the numbers about where the challenges are, I just want to set out the kind of basic framework. This is kind of like a simple way to think about property taxes. The thing about property tax revenues, you look at the base, right, which is, um, and you subtract out any exemptions because that's a hole in the base. You take out the valuation, how do you value the base, what's the rate at which you choose to tax it, and then their enforcement or compliance parameters. I'm just going to be talking about three things, which are the exemptions, the valuation framework, and the tax rate uh, to some extent. So a big challenge that we see is basically where the, the policy framework is pretty broken is in the way valuations are done. So currently, basically, the valuation system that Punjab uses is a presumptive area-based valuation. So you kind of do these door-to-door -door surveys, which are very intensive surveys, which are um, uh, basically costly to undertake. And what you measure is the rental value of a property. The problem is rental markets are really thin. And the second problem is that there, there's no way to actually determine rental contracts. It's a civil contract. So you know, have no verifiable registry of rental contracts. right? So it, it's, it's a market, it's a, it's, 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 it's a poor proxy of trying to get at market value, although any economist here would know that in theory, if markets worked well, you could use one for the other. These tax, this ARB-based system is also really difficult to harmonize because it's the urban property tax that's the only tax that uses ARB as a base. 
the, the, uh, we're talking about recurrent property taxes. This is one tax on property. They're non-recurrent taxes on property. So there's stamp duty, there's transfer on the sale of property, there's capital gain that you... So what you have is basically a very fragmented set of bases, right, which different taxes are using, and it's very difficult, and I don't uh, envy Lagari Saab's job, even if he attempted to focus on it, to develop a harmonized property tax system for the province of the type that Etisham was talking about. The third thing, which is important, is in the law, once the valuation is done, it is, in principle, fixed for five years. So you're fixing the valuation for the tax, even though property values are one of the fastest growing elements uh, in this country. But in, in practice, what happens is that the valuation is not held fixed for five years, it's fixed for like a decade. Because it's really costly for any government to politically pass through a tax after five years. <laughs> right? Because now they have to, the, the last tax uh, valuation that was done was in 2014. And at that time, they were like a 200, 250% pass through that they had to do. And that full pass through has not even happened till date. So it makes it really, really costly. So effectively, what you do is you fix the value, the base, um, and it's not subject to change. The third thing that you do in valuation is when you look at the formula, um, you know, a property consists of built structure and land area. So what the current formula does is it places 90% of the weight of the formula on the built structure. So effectively, when you have very large properties which have very large land areas and small built areas, they get like huge subsidies uh, in this system. And if you have vacant plots, then they're hugely undertaxed, right? Um, uh, th that sort of happens uh, in this system. The final thing on valuation that's there is there are massively big discounts to large property holders. You can't read this, but these are columns. This is the valuation table. This is kind of the rate that is applied for the valuation. Take any, let's say, for cell phone properties. So the, this column says up to 500 square yards of land. This column says exceeding 500 square yards of land. This is up to 3,000 uh, uh, square foot of built area. And this says above. If you compare these values, there's a 20% discount. Right? So the regressivity, in some sense, is actually built into the tax code. What, what puzzled me when I looked at this, and it was actually Secretary Excise that pointed this out, was there has been no debate in Pakistan at all about why these parameters were set. Right? And, and when we, did, we recently did a taxpayer survey of about 1,000 taxpayers. Nobody knows about the basis of the code. But when you look at basically, this is just a comparison of average rental values. Uh, this is for the city of Lahore, uh, for the full uh, property tax cadaster against market-based values, basically, uh, of these properties. What you see is, again, the valuation itself is regressive. So it's, it's regressive, but it also has massive amounts of horizontal inequity, because similarly valued properties are being taxed at different rates. So the valuation uh, uh, framework is pretty much broken. Now, if we step back and we go to exemptions, which is the second thing, this is kind of where the political economy gets interesting. So effectively, the rich are getting hugely undertaxed. So your Gulberg houses and so on are getting hugely undertaxed. But to compensate with that, for that, you, you build in widespread exemptions. So 65% of residential properties in Punjab, of, in Lahore, this is all Lahore data, which is, which is the big, biggest contributor to urban property tax in Punjab. 65% of residential properties are fully exempted, right? And 45% of all properties in Lahore are fully exempted. So you have this huge hole where basically a very, a majority of taxpayers in some sense have no fiscal relationship to the state. They're effectively not part of this system. You have a valuation system that's broken. The exemptions are based on area. So it's on a per marla basis. It is not to do with basically the ability of pay, to pay of taxpayers in terms of income or in terms of wealth. 
This is basically showing the distribution of exempt, which is the green bars and non-exempt properties uh, by land value. And you can see that in terms of value, the exempted properties overlap uh, considerably, particularly in the middle value areas with non-exempted properties. Again, it's, it's massively politically costly. I know every finance minister wants to do it, but it's uh, very polit politically costly. The third element of the property tax system is that effectively this, this low tax is essentially a tax on commercial property, right? So this, is, this graph is simply showing you the comparison of the proportion of, uh, of different categories of properties in Lahore's wealth base, worse, which is the light blue bars, versus their contribution in property tax collection. What you can see is residential properties contribute 48% of Lahore's wealth base, property wealth base or real estate wealth base, but only contribute 22% of the tax. Commercial properties are contributing roughly their share of the value and special properties, which are these big apartment buildings, plazas and so on and so forth, is really where a lot of the new tax is actually coming from. And the question is, why is this happening? And one reason for that is that we have a differential tax rate by use, which, which is there in other countries too. Etasham can talk about this better, but it's a one to five ratio. And effectively, uh, uh, residential properties are also being valued at a very low rate. Now, what's interesting, like experimentally, is in Lahore, in Punjab, we have two property tax systems, one which is run by the government of Punjab's excise and taxation department, the other is by the cantonment boards. So this is just showing you a comparison of a property of similarly valued and um, properties of similar area. This is under the excise and taxation department, a property of one canal, 4,500 square feet, about two and a half crores, pays about 11,000. You take exactly a property with the same parameters in the cantonment board areas, it pays about 71,000. So within basically the same city, you get these very differential rates of, of taxation, and it's not a surprise that DHA is under the cantonment board is pretty well serviced. So the first thing is, you know, there, there are actionable things that can be done um, on the property tax policy side, a lot of these things are there. The department has been pushing for these things. We're going to talk about what some of those propositions are. They're politically costly to do. And one reason that they're politically costly to do is exactly where Etisham ended, which is that the benefit link of taxation, and this is not earlier, all that work was work done by me with my co-authors. This is building on work done by Asim Khaja, um, and uh, Adnan Khan uh, and Ben Olkin uh, at SERP is on the benefit side of taxation. This is a, basically a taxpayer survey of about 2,500 uh, taxpayers in the big cities of, of Punjab. Um, it asks sim simple questions like, it, is it important for citizens to pay tax? I'm just showing you the agreement and disagreement with these statements. About 80% say yes. Second question is, should people pay only taxes only if they get better services? At 80% say yes. Then the third question is, does government use tax revenues to provide services to citizens like you? And suddenly, very few people say yes. There's a follow-up question which says, how much, what percentage of your property tax is spent in services? And about 70% says less than 20%, right? So the visible nature of that link is pretty much broken, and we're doing similar, we're running similar questions now, and that's effectively what we're seeing. And when you start to think about the expenditure side, you basically see that this, you know, it's a fancy word, benefit taxation, right? Benefit linkages. But it is underpinned by an institutional framework, and that institutional framework is pretty much broken. So for example, if you think about the services that property tax would technically or traditionally finance, there's a duality of expenditure functions. So those services are divided between local governments, provincial agencies, provincial departments, right? Uh, and local taxpayers, who are the voters of local governments, can only hold one type 
of function provider accountable. They can't hold the others accountable at all. There are dual responsibilities of services between local governments, development authorities, uh, which is uh, another problem. There are very restricted assignments of social sector functions. So education, for example, has never been devolved even to large local governments. And what's interesting in the recent Local Government Act, which is Section 99, because now local governments exist at the district level, so district include urban areas and rural areas, except urban property taxes are taxes paid by urban areas. But under the new law, those taxes are no longer ring fenced to be spent only on the areas that are con contributing. Because by, by fiat, because of section 99 of the Local Government Act, these revenues now belong to the district, not to the municipality or the metropolitan co corporation uh, that, that, that is there. Now, I've already talking about, talked about how property tax bases are split between government and cantonment boards. Um, the final thing, which is on, on, on the prognosis, which is important, is that there's a centralized determination of the base and the rate. So the base is set by the provincial government, even though this is a local government tax. The rates are, in effect, set by the provincial assembly for five years. So local governments have very little incentives to change that equation. So that's exactly what Atasam said, that what this becomes is a, a revenue sharing arrangement. It's not an own source revenue where the rates and the base are being determined by local governments at the margin. And that's kind of a recipe for disaster um, in terms of accountability. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about some uh, reforms I'm going to do I have like a minute or two okay okay so the first thing is that you know um, and I've drawn a lot on at uh, book with Giorgio Brosio and his work um, I think there's a consensus that's developing that the US model where you do capital value taxation for each property that's really hard to do because the administrative capacity that you need to run that kind of model is really, really difficult. So what is perhaps more feasible is a, a model which uses an area-based zoned system um, of the type that actually, in some sense, Punjab already has, um, except it can be improved. So you know, commercial properties, I think, should be moved to a capital value basis uh, quite fast. Um, I, I think that can be done quite easily. Residential properties are tricky because the political economy, and again, the literature, um, if you read at the time's book particularly, but the literature cited over there, and you talk to any practitioner of property tax, they'll tell you that asset-rich, income-poor houses are uh, a big constituency against any reform. Um, so to partly deal with that problem, you can move towards a banding system that uses capital values, and, but use some annual cost adjustments. Uh, which is linked to the cost of service delivery. Um, the, the important thing about moving to some kind of a CVT, which is shared with other taxes, is that it'll allow tax policy harmonization. So as a provincial finance minister, you can look at what the incidence is of all taxes and properties that you want, and how do you want to minimize distortions, which you can't uh, do at the moment. Um, addressing tax equity, I think, a couple of things can be done. You can abolish the discounts on larger properties. We need to rethink the weight on land area. Um, we need to move away from area-based exemptions. How we do it is a matter of design. But I think it's very important for us to do analytical work to elicit the equity preferences of taxpayers. So, you know, it's like every party talks about progressive taxations but supports regressive taxation. When you've exempted a very large part of the waste, right, uh, it does even a progressive sh schedule have the political economy to support it? Or do we shift towards a neutral tax system? I, I think it's an empirical question uh, that is open, uh, and it's an interesting question. But I think the, the fundamental thing, and I think that's where Mazar left his presentation, and the, that's where Etisham ended, uh, and that's where I'd like to end. 
you have to do something about strengthening accountability and benefit linkages. If citizens don't see services out of their taxes, then the tax battle is lost. And as I showed you sort of statistics, basically that's not what the citizens are seeing. So one of the things is you have to think very seriously about what the optimal assignment of service delivery functions are at the local government level. This is not, the assignment of functions is not a political exercise only. It's also a fiscal exercise. And, and I think we need to start to rethink. And we don't necessarily only need to think about assigned functions that are there, but also related functions and economic components. So we need to start to think about this assignment in these terms. We also may want to experiment with air marking, where we air mark property taxes against services. There's emerging literature that may be effective in some contexts. Um, but again, I use the word experimentation because there isn't clear evidence on this. But I think what is pretty clear is this du duality of functions has to end. You have to create unified administrations at the local government level, which are under local governments and which can be made accountable through the local electoral uh, linkage uh, and, and a bond of accountability can be forged around services. This does not exist at the moment. And my last thing is you need to liberate the tax rate from the province, from the provincial assembly. Um, that's not, in principle, a local government can set a tax rate, but you know, I've worked with government for 12 years, and one of the big things that I think is, you know, academics you know, think in terms of principles, not in terms of practice. The fact is that the moment you have a set tax rate, no local government is actually going to pass a budget resolution on tax. It's politically costly. And currently, your budget rules do not require them to pass that motion. <laughs> you have to force local governments to pass budget motions. They can pass a null tax motion, that's fine, but the motion has to be tabled in the House. So you have to have that extra level of detail in which the institution has to be tweaked. Um, so I, I, I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you. you. so much, uh, Dr. Yeah. Um, uh, Sab, I'd like to ask you, Shall we take a round of questions first, and then would you like to, because it might give you a, a sense of the, you've seen the presentations, a flavor of what the, the audience is thinking. So let, let's uh, if, have a show of hands, please, if there are any questions. We'll take two or three of them. Yeah, there's one there. Anything more? Anybody else? Okay, okay, one, two, and three. Let's have these three and, and then, uh, then and then see how it goes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Vakas Paracha, PFM advisor, uh, working with government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Uh, my question is from the Chima Saab. We are also working on this property tax there in KP. And my question is regarding the property tax on commercial properties. So in KP, we have two taxation systems, one based on the rental value, and second based on the capital value, uh, rather locality factor table. And the government is also interested to move towards this advalorum tax basis me method. But the issue is that the value of the plot, what will be the value of the plot? So one, we, we have one value which is stated given by the owner, second by the FBR, third is the DC rate. So we have different values. And the government is thinking about, see the, uh, and the FBR value is, is only for a few districts, not all districts of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So we are thinking to move towards the DC rate, but we were also uh, facing an issue with the DC rate that it's a uh, single rate for entire that city, so which is also not very uh, rationalized. So what do you suggest to apply a very rationalized and effective taxation system? Okay, specific question, but we'll, we'll yeah. come back to it. Let's hear the other two. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rahil. I'm a retired civil servant. And uh, taking cue from Ijaz Nabi's early session and uh, brilliant moderation, that one should be very frank. So uh, very frankly, I'll be asking a question, putting up the question to Mohsen Lawari Saab. But before I do that, 
I would pass on a little comment also. And the comment is that in this modern age, in this modern era of video leaks and audio leaks, though I was interested in your video leaks, but we got the audio leaks instead, in which somebody was trying to put pressure on you, and you stood your grounds and you said, okay, is it good for the state or is it not good for the state? So thank you very much for that. Can and we appreciate uh, what you did for us. And now, a very frank question, now that you are the finance, finance minister, and you have an agriculture background also, you are an agriculturist also. Could we get the, to the base, question? taxation base of agriculture, income, income tax is very broad. Though the revenue generated by the government from agriculture income tax is, is very meager. So what are your comments about that? Okay, thank you. Um, third question. Uh, I think it was here, the gentleman. Idhar, I guess. <coughs> Asalaamu As Alaikum. I am Ahmed Saeed. I'm additional director general exercise in Punjab. My question is to uh, Mr. Chima. Uh, tax is essentially a local government tax. It should be devolved to the local government. But do you think it is not important prior to shifting to it that the, our local government institutions should be, uh, should have capacity to assess and collect those taxes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And any others? Uh, no? One more. Let's take one more. Um, um, Particularly, I'm interested in this one in terms of this linkage, you know, the, the linkage in terms of not just looking at taxation just by itself in a bucket as a silo, but really interconnected with the concept of benefits and accountability and so forth. So, please. I wanted to ask, you talked about tax deterrence. And I wanted to ask how can FBR capacity be increased essentially to decrease so that they can actually do something about the deterrence? Okay. Thank Should you. We start with that and yes. And Let's, uh, yes, absolutely. Would, uh, would, uh, would uh, Mazar or Etasham, did you hear the questions? Could you hear the questions? No. The last one, I didn't, I couldn't hear the last one. Uh, so, so the last one is um, what can be done to improve FBR capacity? What kind of measures can be taken? So if you and Mazar could comment on that. Yeah, I think uh, tax administration reform has to go hand in hand with tax policy reform. I don't think that, you know, you, even if you had uh, an efficient tax administration like the Chinese, that they would do very much better in the Pakistan tax policy milieu. Although, you know, of course, they've made huge gains with the use of big data and, uh, you know, the blockchain and so on. So really what one needs to do is to think again about integrating the tax base for tax administration purposes. I think there's some suggestions underway under the IMF and World Bank uh, agencies, but really legally to have a consolidated income tax a new tax base for the provinces, piggybacking on the wider area bases, such as the income tax, but not on the VAT. VAT revenue should be shared, keeping the proportions of the 18th Amendment. So really not going beyond the 18th Amendment uh, proportions, but having a unified tax administration and a unified policy, I think, is the is, is the way to go. The other point I'd make is that for uh, effective accountability, you need control over rates at the subnational level, not administration. So, you know, if you have a control, say, of the ability to set a tax for Punjab on the consolidated income tax for agricultural properties and income, other income, that is sufficient for accountability purposes. You don't have to administer it yourself. And I think that's a mistake being made. You know, it goes back to the Government of India Act, but also in the Indian case where you now have a unified, moving to a unified VAT base, but 32 administrations makes a complete dog's breakfast of the VAT. So they're moving in the right direction, but not yet. Okay, thank uh, you. So really, unifying the tax base involves uh, also 
a simpler administration and a more feasible administration. Thank, thank you, Etisham. Um Wasim, if you have uh, uh, li literally 30 seconds, just to add to that, we're just running out of time before the next session. Yeah, and I do want Lagari so, Saab to have his say because that's important. So, so in 30 seconds, so I would say just put a pause on like new tax reforms okay. and just first take stock. So why this myriad of like tax reforms we have implemented in the last 10 years, why have they not delivered? So unless we learn lessons, so there's no point like going on that trajectory of like introducing reforms for reform's sake and not worrying about the delivery. Excellent. Can I make one quick point, Ahmed Sir? So, so I wasn't sort of, I'm saying exactly what Itasham is saying. I'm not saying that anything changes right now. All I'm saying is that in the Local Government Act, you have to force them to pass a tax motion. They may pass the tax that is set. The other thing that I think is a good thing that's brought about by the Local Government Act is that now the Assembly will not fix the tax year rate for five years. So now the Provincial Finance Commission has to set a band, and the local governments have to pick, pass a resolution as to where the rates would be in that particular band. Um, so I, I take your point that you know if, if you completely decentralize administration, even if they have capacity, I'm at one with it, Sham, I, I don't think that that'll be a good model. Okay. Jean, over to you. I'll start off with uh, answering Rahil's question about uh, the agriculture uh, taxation. I, for one, am a firm believer that everybody should be paying their due share for the country. Whatever we are earning, no matter what the source of income, we should be paying that. <coughs> uh, but unfortunately, we have this... Uh, culture of tax evasion, as uh, was demonstrated in the data shared by us, that despite different incentives or the uh, amnesty schemes or all those things that were done, the, the rates were decreased, the rates were increased, not much changed. So nobody would actually be keeping record for the agriculture. And similarly, our, our, our traders, our businessmen, our small businessmen, they're not keeping any track. Uh, a, a coca may be somewhere you go and have your Coke uh, in the evenings, or when we were younger, we used to do that. So he would run tabs of about 70, 80,000 rupees for, for people. And I'm talking about 70, 80,000 rupees long time back. Uh, so they also don't keep any tab of uh, bookkeeping. So for the agricultural income tax, I had proposed this last year in one of our resource mobilization commission committee, but I was, didn't get much support was that we can make a survey of the average uh, ran, land rent in the country, uh, in the province and then set that as a benchmark, and then assume that if you own, if Rahil Siddiqui owns 10 acres of land, we're going to assume that the average rent, uh, land rent is 40,000 rupees a year. So 10 acres, 40,000, 4 lakh rupees, Rahil Siddiqui, you should have made 4 lakh rupees, we're going to tax you, we're going to generate a demand for a tax for you. There was this big, there was argument on that, that the land rent is different in different places. I mean, a colleague of ours from Rahim Yar Khan said that I get 120,000 rupees an acre. Uh, I and Dera Ghazi Khan get 35,000 rupees an acre. So there's a wide range of things. So for that reason, it was decided that we should take average of the thing. And then the Barani areas and the uh, canal fed areas, they also had different views on that. But that is one thing that we can start on with. We can say, okay, uh, we're not going to take the 120,000 extreme or the 10,000 rupee extreme, we're going to say uh, 20,000 rupees per acre is assumed to be your income from. There has to be an assumption because there are, aren't going to be any bookkeeping. So we start off with that, and whatever the federal government's FBR's tax uh, brackets are, that you get an exemption of I mean, 4 lakh rupees, so you get an exemption of 4 lakh rupees. You pay 5% on your next uh, tranche, you get second, whatever. And that would, one, I, I honestly believe this. One, this would break that myth of the agriculture sector not paying their due share. Because of the land holdings, you have been in revenue department, the land holdings now are, uh, I think over 90% of the land holdings are less than 12 and a half acres. And these are probably more, sir. So the land holdings are also very small. So this myth will be broken that the agriculture sector is somehow avoiding paying taxes. Big land holdings are there, but very few, and they should be taxed. 
I mean, uh, the, the orchard's incomes are phenomenal. I have my cousins who have orchards, they get very good money out of their produce. So there has to be a mechanism where we should be doing. I'm a firm believer that we should be doing that. That'll, that'll make people think of a more fairer society. Right now, everybody looks at the agriculturists as the, as the villains, that is, as if they're the ones who are taking anybody else's share. But that villainous, if something is villainous on not paying taxes, your, your shopkeepers here are also not paying them. Let's go to, I don't know, Brandreth Road and see what kind of a business and turnover they have and what kind of a taxes do they pay. Let's go see uh, Liberty or Jail Road or wherever you go. So that, that is unfortunately our culture. I firmly believe, on, 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 on a general scale, I firmly believe that somehow our people have to be uh, told, this, this, these values have to be inculcated in them that they have to pay their due share. You, you convince them and they do. I'll give you, uh, share an example with you. I was a minister for irrigation. And irrigation abiyana was a, was a joke. It was 50, 000, uh, 50 rupees for, per acre for uh, the uh, rabi and 85 rupees for kharib. 135 rupees per acre per year was what the abiyana was. And if somebody who's, who uses tube wells, the tube well costs were between 10 to 15,000 rupees per acre. So here is, here is somebody is getting canal water for 135, and somebody who's using his, his tube well is paying 10 to 15,000. Canal water with all its uh, minerals and enrichments, like nutrient for your uh, crop. He's paying 135, and the, so I, I asked around, I talked to people, the only thing they said was that the, the reliability should be there. We should be ensured that we get our share of water. So to get the share of the water, the system has to be maintained. Our canal system is largest in the world, but we hardly spend much money on its maintenance. So I would, wherever I would go, I would talk to people and get feedback from them. I said, we'll raise your uh, abiyana and we'll, we'll maintain the system and we'll deliver you better water. And uh, from 135, we jumped to 270. That was a 100% increase. I don't recall much hue and cry about it. Next year, we increased it by another 135. So now it's 405 rupees per acre. And I don't share, because that money was earmarked rink fence for the maintenance MNR of the canal system. So people started seeing their water delivery improving. And uh, I don't know about this year, but I think in the first two years uh, when we were there, we increased or we increased the efficiency of the system by improving water delivery by 57%. I'm not saying every tail was getting its due share, but if somebody was dry, there was two inches of water there now. If somebody had two inches at the tail, it would increase to about four inches a tail. And uh, even in my own constituency in our area, uh, there were canals which uh, tails received water after 27 years. There were cases where people had given up on coming water, coming their way, and they had encroached upon the, the waterways. And when water, this is what happened. So you have to convince people that this money is going to be used for your benefit, and they will be paying. Right now, that disconnect because the service, people think that the money that I'll be paying, my taxation, would not be serving me. So that is the reason people have this hesitation of paying taxes. Somehow that communication has to be there, and uh, I don't know how we do that, but that has to be done. Uh, and another thing, uh, it's, it's always a wonderful idea to interact with uh, academics. We learn a lot. It broadens our horizons. And I think the interaction between policymakers and, and academia should be much more than it actually is. Because uh, we, the policymakers, or we, the people, people's representatives, are looking at things from uh, a very, uh, how do I put it, a very elementary, basic point of view. My, my decision or my influence would be uh, my voter who would come in and expect a certain road being built for his, 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 his area. Or somebody coming in expecting a transfer for the teacher that works there. They just opened the transfers and it's, I'm going crazy now. They were banned for a few years, for the for last couple of years, and now they've opened. So for them, that transfer is everything. For them, that road is everything. We have made people believe that this brick and mortar thing is the only way to progress. We have, we have failed to inculcate in people that we have to work on the human resources and the policy making. The policies which 
which will benefit them in later stages. I had, uh, um, I don't know if I should be saying this, but we had this um, meeting the other day, uh, and I was telling my PTI friends, uh, uh, and this, I think I was able to get it through to them. I said, in our younger days, when we were very actively following cricket, uh, the West Indies had uh, Michael Holding and Andy Roberts and Sylvester Clark and all those fast bowlers, and the West uh, and Australia had Dennis Lilly and Thompson and all those people. So they would make green top wickets. So the ball would just whiz past. And India had Chandrasekhar and Bedi and all, so they would make those spinning wickets. So I keep telling my colleagues uh, in the party that if we are also be going to be doing what the others have been doing, we'll be playing on their wicket. We need to move to whatever our advantage is. And something that needs to be uh, addressed properly right now is the policy thing. We should be, we as Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, as a party, should be talking about what governance and what policy making decisions are we going to be make, making, which will change the destiny of the coming generations. How are we going to set them right? There has been a, Moyal Sahib is here, there has been a decay in governance, sir, even in our lifetime, we've observed how things have gone bad. Because over a period of year, we have, we have uh, moved away from doing the right thing to trying to do everything which is popular. There has to be a balance between what is right and what is popular. If we keep, so similarly, in the taxation or, or the revenue generation, we have to let people know that this money is for you. This is your money which will be spent on you. On because I know that the next session oh. is, is waiting. This is something. Um, so f <laughs> forgive me for, for interrupting you, Lagari Saab. Um, I just, I, I, I hope that if nothing else, this session has left you with at least one or two major messages. The first is that one shouldn't just be looking at taxation as just something by itself. One has to look at it in the context of what it is that you're trying to do, the human capital that yep. you're trying to build, the SDGs that you're trying to implement, which is actually develop your own country. So I think that is a major message. I think another major message that comes out of it from all our speakers from the technical side, actually, is that you have to design a system of taxation that then is responsive to that. And that means designing it at different levels, with different levels of accountability, at the local level, the provincial level, the federal, not just having a system which is kind of driven just by one party and, and money transfers all around in order to meet whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. So if, if nothing else, I hope we, we go away with that and I hope this discussion continues because it clearly is an yeah, is important one. Thank you Thank very you. much.